Okay. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, today uh, here Dr. Ali Ferrari, uh, who's uh, on the faculty in computer science and engineering at the University of Washington. Uh, Dr. Ferrari got his uh, PhD uh, from University of Urbana, uh, Illinois, Urbana Champaign. Uh, following uh, his PhD, he's, uh, he's held a postdoc position at Carnegie Mellon. And uh, also, he's now heading the uh, Plato uh, project uh, uh, at Allen Institute at the University of Washington. Uh, it, I should say the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, sorry. And uh, his uh, main research uh, interests lie in the area of computer vision and machine learning. And in, uh, in fact, he's interested in semantic scene understanding and visual knowledge extraction, object recognition, and all the related topics, of course, to that. Uh, he's been awarded uh, the Allen uh, Distinguished Inves Investigator uh, Award. He also had uh, an uh, inaugural Google Fellowship in Computer Vision at the University of Urbana, uh, of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he's held several uh, best paper awards in CVPR, AAI, etc. And it's a pleasure to have him here talk to us today about visual reasoning. And uh, thank you for coming. And the floor is yours, Ali. Thank you. Thanks for your introduction. Pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about sort of steps or baby steps that we're planning to take toward a problem of visual reasoning. Um, so the progress in the field of, in, across AI actually over the past few years have been amazing. So this, the pace is just un, 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 uncatchable. The, the, the every, every single day you're going to see new things, new progress. The state of the arts are actually getting beaten every other day. It's been actually amazing across a variety of different fields in AI, in computer vision, NLP, robotics, uh, hardcore AI, hardcore ML, deep learning. So there, there, are, there are many exciting things happens over this, uh, over this, uh, over the past few years, and now we can actually we can sort of rely on the output of what we can build off of our visual recognition systems. So one of the things I want to actually show is uh, is the project called Yolo, uh, done by Joe Redman, a student of mine at University of Washington, and his goal is basically can I build a deep learning based object detection system that runs in real time on his laptop. So basically he's showing his office where he's sort of have a crappy webcam pointing at his screen watching YouTube videos. And these are sort of trained on standard ImageNet Coco kind of data set and these, kind of, these are the kinds of recognition results that you can get in real time from a detection systems these days. There's nothing temporal with this system so basically we're doing per frame and that the whole point of him running a system like this is uh, to show how fast you can do real-time object detection and how reliable it is. And these days with our recent stuff, we can actually do it on a CPU of a cell phone. So we have demos of systems like this on a CPU of a cell phone. Uh, we can even have demos, we have demos like, like this on a Raspberry Pi and a Raspberry Pi Zero, a $5 computer that you can actually just buy it and you can do deep learning based object detection on systems like that. So great progress, but the issue is that there's actually a huge gap between what we call these days visual understanding and what visually intelligent agents in real world can perform. Um, and I'm basically, I've been using this video for a while just to showcase how, how far we are from building a, a, a visual intelligent agent. So this is basically a video of a crow watching a fisherman in Arctic digging a hole in the ice. So basically the crow has such a rich understanding, visual understanding of the environment that he can actually plan for steps to achieve a certain goal. So the crow sees that the fisherman is actually digging a hole, grabbing a piece of stick, attaching a rope to it at the end of, other end of the rope is a bait, and the crow is just watching this scene. And the minute that the fisherman is actually walking away, the crow knows exactly what to expect. And he can actually plan a sequence of actions 
one after the other to obtain his goal. He knows that if he flies to the hole, he can actually grab the stick. If he pulls the rope, he should expect something edible on the other end of the rope. And he knows how to achieve that by just pulling the rope. Or the, uh, and once he do that, basically he knows what are the actions, what are the consequences of the actions, what can he expect as an outcome of an action, and he can actually just lay them one after the other in a way that he can actually achieve his goal. This is just phenomenally rich understanding of the word. And what I'm trying to say is that carrying the state of the art recognition systems, despite this amazing progress, are really, really far away from this. The minute that actually he sees the, the fisherman is running back to the hole, he knows that I have to fly away because I'm well aware of the consequences. And I have this basically this amazing planning system that can build a sequence of actions one after the other. Um, for different versions of these talks, I actually use this, this term for my talk. I didn't want to use it because I didn't know what kind of audience should I expect. But for many of the talks, I actually say, let's croify recognition. And let's move toward this, this close level of understanding of the visual world. Such a rich level of understanding. What do I need to do that? Well, there are multiple different things that we need to do that. And we're really, really far away from that rich level of image understanding. But we want to move toward that goal. So I need, obviously, a parsing mechanism. And this is basically what most of the efforts in across the whole community in machine learning, computer vision, AI has been actually sort of dedicated effort to do this. And parsing means can I build object detection system, can I build action detection system, action recognition systems, and things like that. But to, for me to be able to sort of plan, I need reasoning systems. And this is basically, go, there have been year, many, 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 many years of AI research and reasoning. And basically, I want to couple that with, with visual reasoning. And obviously, if I want to do any kind of reasoning, the core part for a reasoning system is knowledge. And we need to figure out a way to extract what I tend to call visual knowledge. Um, and for uh, everything that we do these days is data hungry, and we need to figure out a way to sort of collect different kinds of data. So what I'm, what I'm planning for today is just basically show you uh, Snapchat, or show you basically just very, very few pieces of works, and snapshots of different pieces of work that we've been doing across this spectrum. Um, I'm going to be talking about maybe 10 to 12 different papers. Each, some of the slides that I'm going to be showing are each basically one, one slide per, pa per paper. It might be dense. Um, uh, stop me afterward. Uh, we can actually be happy to talk offline about the details of any of those things. So for today, I'm basically planning to give a very high level talk on where we are and how far we've moved and where we're planning to go. So let me start by basically what do I need to be able to sort of croify what I tend to call Croify vision. Well, I need to do to build object detection and scene detection systems. I need to figure out the knowledge about the objects. I need to understand actions to the extent that I can actually perform actions to the system. And if I want to perform anything, I need to be able to predict the expected outcome of an actions. And I need to be able to reason and plan. Um, so let's start with just the parsing part. Let's basically see a little bit of what it means to parse the visual data. And since I want to basically move toward croifying vision, so I'm interested in an action-centric parse of a word. So I want to understand how can I detect actions. Uh, literature and computer vision suggest a big pool of different approaches. What's common among almost all of them is that we, can, we encode actions similar to objects. To us, the, way, the same way that I build a car detector, I would build a kicking and fixing and biking detector. But actions to me are functions, and functions that take arguments. So actions in inherently are structured data that basically if an action like fixing would have agent. The, in this case, the agent of fixing is a boy. It will have objects, which is a car. There are parts being fixed, which is a tire. There are tools that people use to fix objects with, which is a tire iron. And it's happening, uh, in this case, in an outdoor environment. So how do I build predictions like that? This is sort of a rich level of understanding of an action, because not only do you understand the verb, but also you understand all of the arguments. You can see the verbs as functions that can take arguments. And what I want to do is I want to basically do this joint structured prediction of not only the verbs, but also the roles and the values that each role would take. 
Note that different verbs would take different kinds of roles and different kind of environment might actually specify different kinds of values for different kinds of roles. So such a data does not exist, so how, do, how, can, we, how can we deal with this problem? Well, uh, Mark Yatskar, uh, uh, Luke Mario and I actually went together and sort of built this gigantic data set. I tend to regard this as the ImageNet of the verbs. If you've seen ImageNet, this is basically this larger scale, very influential data sets for objects, and this is sort of the corresponding con co component for verbs. We went through a frame net for linguists in the room. Basically, this is a linguistic resource that specifies verbs and their arguments. Almost most all of the verbs are not vis non visual, uh, contemplating, thinking. These are things that do not have visual connotation. So, we don't want to study them. So, we went through all of the verbs in, uh, or majority of the verbs in frame net. We filtered the non visual ones, and the rest of them basically we collect data for them. Um, we have something in the order of uh, one and a half million annotations in this data set. It's a large data set with more than 200,000 uh, frames labeled across a variety of different images. Uh, and you can actually download the data, play with data at institute.org. I'm going to actually show you a demo of this shortly. Uh, how do I do structure prediction? So for those of you who care about uh, deep structure prediction algorithms, so what we do, again, very quickly over the algorithm, we have an embedding of an image of some sort, and then we have different tensors embedding all of the potentials of a CRF. And at the end of the day, we figured a way to backpropagate a CRF loss through these embedding layers, through these uh, uh, VGG or whatever deep learning of your choice, through them basically to learn the features that allow me to learn the embeddings of the potential functions of a CRF. Uh, and at the end of the day, basically, if you do this careful enough, then you can actually do predictions of this sort. These are sort of structured predictions that allow you to understand the, uh, an image to the extent that you can actually relate objects within an image. This is a picture of falling. The agent of a falling is a person. The source is a horse. This person is actually falling from a horse to the ground in a field. So this is basically it's saying a lot about the image. Uh, this is basically the, what's happening is a spearing. The agent of spearing is a person. The victim is a fish. It's happening in ocean. Uh, let me, so basically, we opened this up at mc2.org. Uh, a few New York Times art, uh, journalists actually started playing with this. They uploaded their own photos. This is my actually favorite one. So this is one of the news photos that they uploaded. And the prediction for this, you might not be able to read it. It basically says, the verb is happening is dropping for this. The agent is a helicopter. The item, I don't know what it is. This, the source or starting point of a dropping is helicopter. The destination is a land and it's happening in the air. Um, and they did, a, they did a nice piece on this, uh, on this piece of work. Oh, let me just show you a quick demo of what is possible and what is not possible. And so if I go to mc2.org, so this, this, this place allows you to sort of download the whole data, browse through the data, and figure out what's in the data. It's fairly rich, um, and it tells you a lot about verbs. For example, I don't know. You can actually browse it through the data whenever you have time. You can actually ask what do, like, if I'm, I just said, what do horses do? And the list is actually much longer, much larger than what I would have expected. They do the standard rearing and running, and uh, they can be vehicles of actually pulling. They might be stumbling. They might be splashing. They might be actually the, 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 uh, the item of being loaded. They might be the agent of eating. And, and the list is just goes on and on. But I, what, what I wanted to show you is actually the demo uh, that you can download the code. You can download the data on this page. Uh, for a picture, I don't know, let's say for a picture like this, you can actually put a picture in a query and get predictions that looks like this. So these are sort of structured predictions. The top rated prediction is the verb that's happening for this image is fixing. The agent is a man. The thing being fixed is a roof. It's had the, the object part is a panel. The tool is hand. That It's happening outdoor. So these are basically sort of rich understanding of what's happening in an image. And if you, look, if you look at the image, the number of pixels that corresponds to, let's say, the panel is fairly small. The reason that we can predict those is because we are sort of tying together all of those predictions. How many different things you would be fixing on a roof 
in an outdoor. Third, actually, the space is fairly limited, and few pixels that correspond to this limited panel might be enough that convince the model that maybe I should actually predict panel for this spot. So let's do this. Uh, somebody want to suggest me a verb. I can actually go to Google Images, find a picture, and do some a quick, a quick demo. So can you specify more? So do you want to pick, let's just say this one. Sometimes Google redirects these addresses, so if they do, I have to go to. Okay, so basically, the predictions are, for this image, first prediction is smelling, a woman is smelling an item in a room. The second prediction is eating, a woman is eating a salad, the container, I don't know what it is, the tool is fork and it's happening inside. So these are sort of the kinds of predictions that you can make by this sort of deep structured predictions of entities. Um, so this is sort of just one small step toward understanding verbs better to the extent that I can actually understand them as a function, as a function that would change the state of the word from the state of the word before the action to the state of the word after the action, going back to our old definitions of preconditional effects and action in old school AI. So you can, call, you can download the code data, uh, uh, the live demo, everything actually from institute.org, play with it. Well, let me just pass over to the next topic. Um, just keep track of time. Okay, so you, you're, gonna, you're gonna tell me when I'm five minutes away, right? Okay. So I'm gonna basically, I'm gonna keep going till the time arrives and I just stop whatever we are. Um, so the other core component that we we'll spend a lot of our time on these days is data. Our algorithms are data hungry, and we need to figure out a way to deal with data. Particularly for what interests me, I'm interested in data for actions. And what I like is sort of everyday action data that tell, allows me to learn about precondition and effects and how it looks like and all of those items for daily activities. Daily activities might be me walking to a podium, opening a door, opening a fridge, drinking a, uh, from a bottle of water, all of those kinds of boring daily activities. Where do I get enough data to be able to actually build models for these kind of activities? Well, it turns out actually it's fairly hard. And there is a reason that almost all of the action recognition data sets in computer vision are centered around sports. Because sports are just these well-defined structured domains from which we can grab a lot of data. Oftentimes, these data are structured in a way that they're basically corresponding to golf, swimming, skateboarding, jumping, skiing, kicking, these kind of things. These are great test beds to sort of start our, our, our exploration of what it means to kick something visually. But beyond that, they don't allow me to further explore the connectivity between actions to be able to chain up sequence of actions and all of those things. So this is basically the standard action recognition data sets do not work for, for us. We started actually crawling YouTube for what I tend to call boring actions, and we failed. It turns out to be extremely expensive to mine boring daily actions from YouTube videos, mainly because who would put pictures of a person opening a fridge in YouTube? And if you even search YouTube for opening a fridge, you're going to find examples of dogs opening the fridge, rabbits opening the fridge, and these kind of exciting things. Because no one, put, no one is actually interested in, po in posting boring stuff. And I'm interested in boring stuff. So for a while, I was thinking that maybe we should actually start hiring actors or people who wanted to be actor and fail uh, to sort of act boring stuff for us. This stuff didn't scale, and there were so many problems. So uh, my co-authors, Gunnar and Abhinav Gupta and Ivan Laptev and, and all, many other people came up with this idea that maybe we can actually sort of crowdsource it, but crowdsource it in a non-conventional way. What if we ask Turkers to tell us what they do during the day, and it would be basically asking Turkers, what do you do? And it would be basically, I walk to a fridge in the morning, I open up the fridge, I grab the, the jar of milk, and I drink from it, and I put it back into the fridge, and I close the fridge. That's just one boring script of, a, of, of what, what we do, probably almost all of us every day. Some of us are more civilized and don't drink from the jar. 
some of us do. So basically, that's sort of the extent to which this, the, the extent to which I actually uh, the, the extent of activities that I'm interested in. But where do I get the actual videos? It turns out that you can actually ask other Turkers to film their morning stuff, going to the fridge, grabbing a bottle of milk, opening it up and drinking it, and just film themselves over their cell phones, give us the contest and everything, and just basically post it on a YouTube link, and then we, get, we grab the YouTube link. So we ended up doing this crazy thing that we started actually asking Turkers, can I have a video of your, your boring daily activities? And the answer turns out to be yes. So these are basically examples of those. The script says a person opens a fridge, begins drinking out of a jug of milk before closing it. And these are basically the kinds of examples that people on Mechanical Turk sort of uploaded for us of their daily life. And this is sort of the kind of actions that I'm interested in. The very, very boring stuff that are super exciting for me to watch these. I can actually watch these for hours. But they're boring. They're basically daily activities. And we ended up basically figuring out the right mechanism to sort of scale this up and collect more and more examples. I'm going to show you one more example of these boring stuff. Um, let me just maybe go to this one. A person falls asleep on a couch, living uh, in the living room, watching TV, blah, blah, blah. And that's basically exactly what's happening in the video. So this would allow me to study actions, but more important for me is it would allow me to sort of start, start thinking about how actions come one after the other. And I might be able to actually study temporal dependencies between actions in a way that people can actually chain up different things to achieve a goal. We end up collecting these large scale data, so we're still actually collecting more and more videos every day. So there are 10,000 videos, more than 300 people are actually contributing, these numbers are old, from dif three different continents. Uh, there are almost 40,000 activities involved, uh, and there are something in the order of 200 action, action class type are involved in this data set. So this is sort of, and we, we again went back and sort of temporarily labeled everything so that you can actually have the right set of data that, that's, available, uh, that's available online. So you can actually... Okay, I open up my old slide. You can actually download it from, uh, if you look for uh, charades data set at AI2, you can actually find AI2 charades data set. You can download it right now and you can actually start playing with, uh, with, with the data. People have already started doing that. We're planning to do a, a challenge on it. You will soon hear about the challenge. But this is sort of a very first step on getting large scale data sets of boring stuff. Let me go to the other element. So I need to know about the word. And if you talk to any reasoning person, AI reasoning person, the very first component that you would need to reason is a form of data, a form of knowledge. There are huge literature on knowledge representation. How should I represent the knowledge? What kind of knowledge can I crawl? What kind of knowledge? I cannot crawl. What kind of knowledge do I need? And I don't want to actually even touch on those uh, during this talk. But a small portion of that would be what I tend to call visual knowledge. The kind of knowledge that is too obvious for people that no one is going to write about it anywhere. That means that all of those text-based or NLP-based knowledge extraction systems would not scale to this domain, would not extend to this domain, mainly because no one would write down that the sheep are not green. It's just so obvious that no one would write it down. But visually, I might need that. No one would tell me that elephants are, are bigger than butterflies because it's just too damn obvious. And those are the kinds of knowledge that I do need for my visual reasoning system. And this is basically what we're aiming at building. So the very first thing that you need to build for a visual reasoning system is what I call sort of a scalable recognition system, a scalable detection system. So standard pipelines of action, object recognition, action recognition is sort of the supervised mechanism. You start with images. you find a way to label them with bounding boxes of objects. You, tr you pick your choice of algorithm, you train it, you test it, and you're done. The, part, the problem with the scalable recognition is the very, first, the very first part. Where do I get the training data for large number of categories? And the minute that I actually go to combinations, the space becomes combinatorial, and I don't know how to deal with this. The biggest that we have right now is ImageNet, maybe the ImageNet Challenge, 1,000 categories. If you go to bounding boxes, the number is even smaller. So we need to figure out a way to alleviate the need for constant supervision. 
And we did this project, we call it, we made a joke about it, we call it learning everything about anything, in short, Leaven. But the core idea is that I might be able to actually crawl supervision from the web. And we build a system that can query the web for different kinds of keywords, come up with different ways of com using uh, linguistic constraints like n-grams to sort of limit the search space. I don't want to talk about it, but at the end of the day, what you end up having is this sort of fully automated system that allows you to sort of train concepts of interest for yourself. So in this 11.cs.uw.edu, uh, or you can actually do lovenai.lnai.org. You can actually have this button over here that says add concept. And you can add your new concept. People would basically, the system automatically would learn a class of a detector for you for that concept. And people actually, we started up with 20 standard categories in Pascal. People have started using it and the whole community has started basically querying a lot and a lot. And right now we are basically over 180 million images labeled with this system with more than uh, with more than uh, 200,000 different uh, classes of objects. Just compare it with ImageNet uh, Challenge, which is 1,000, or with Im whole ImageNet, which is 20,000. So this basically allows us to sort of go to extend, to go to like basically larger scales and build this system that can learn from the web about query co concepts that it receives. Why do I need to do that? Because basically I need to do this to be able to start doing knowledge extraction, and this is what we did. So we did a project called Visky, uh, not that one, but which is basically sort of a visual knowledge extraction system that allows you to sort of extract knowledge from the, from the web by sort of looking into the pictures of the web. Uh, let me do you an example. Do you guys think dogs eat ice cream? How do you know that? So you've seen examples of dogs eating the ice cream. And that's exactly what I want to do. I want to build this intelligent agent that can verify facts for me by watching, uh, watching real world. Of course, my agent lives in my computer, so the word for my agent would be web. And what I want to do is I basically, for those of you who are not convinced, if I show you these pictures, you're convinced that dogs do eat ice cream. Why are you convinced? Because there are enough pictures on the web where there is a dog, there is an ice cream. The dog is in the eating pose, and the ice cream is in the right end of a dog. And that's basically what I want to do. I want to basically build a system that can sort of do fact checking by just looking into the images on the web. What do I need for this? I need to be able to build detectors on the fly. I need to basically, whenever the, my system hits a query that says, do dogs eat ice cream, I need to build dog detector. I need to build ice cream detector. I even need to build dog eating detector, I need to build eating ice cream detector, and I also need to build dog eating ice cream detector. How do I do that? Well, basically I went to the Leaven system and I train all of those. And we end up basically having this uh, system that can sort of verify facts to you, and it can actually attach a score to a query fact. How likely do you think this fact is true based on the pictures on the web? How do we do this? In short, basically, you can start with a query that says, do bears fish salmon? Uh, I'm going to verify that. Basically, I'm going to go download a bunch of images, query the Google Images Search or Yahoo or whatever you like with pictures of four bears fishing salmon. Then I start building my detectors in an automatic way. There's no supervision involved. So basically, I build my salmon detector. I build my, uh, my bear fishing detector, fishing salmon detector, bear fishing salmon detector, and all of those things. And then I form this factor graph, which what it does at the end of the day is basically the consistency check that I told you about, which is do things spatially and visually consistent enough that I can verify this fact. And it turns out that if I actually do a most probable explanation of a factor graph, I can talk offline about how to do this, I can actually attach a score to a query, uh, query uh, input. And we ended up basically being able to sort of verify lots and lots of different tasks, do horses draw a carriage, the, we are very, our system is very confident that the, the horses do draw a carriage, do horses lay egg, our system is actually not confident that horses lay egg. And there are so many mistakes in this, for example, do horses read book, or uh, my favorite is do cats wear glasses. Our system is actually very, very confident that ha cats do wear glasses, the reason is people put their glasses on cats and take pictures of those. So in, in my agent's world, it's one of, one of the most true facts is cats do wear glasses because I've seen enough cats with glasses on them that I'm pretty sure it's consistent. 
and you can actually start sort of answering questions about these kinds of facts. So basically, this is sort of extracting the knowledge about, about, uh, about relationships from web data. There's way more things to actually extract. One of the other projects that we did is sort of, we call it segment phrase table. For those of you who, who, who do NLP or close to NLP stuff, so the way that people do, or the most successful examples of machine translation came when they invented translation tables. So translation tables are these gigantic tables of, let's say, English and French and different phrases in correspondence. And then there are actually nice algorithms that can sit on the top of this gigantic phrase table and do translation for you. And I wanted to do the same thing. I wanted to basically build this gigantic tables between the images space and phrases. How do I do that in scale? So I need to basically, again, use the Levin system and use a little bit of a co-segmentation. I don't go over it. Uh, I'm sorry. But at the end of the day, I'm going to end up with this very large table that sits right between the language and vision and aligns pieces of image, image segments, with phrases. And if I do this, they can actually start do translation systems. Then I can actually start doing entailment. I call it visual entailment. And it says basically horse, horse grazing entails, entails horse standing, but not the other way around. And these are just such an obvious facts that no one mentions them explicitly in text. But I should be able to crawl that from visual data that's available. I can do visual paraphrasing. A horse jumping and a horse leaping are sort of the same thing. And I can actually start doing sort of some sort of relative similarity check. The way that cats stand up is more similar to the way that bears stand up compared to cats and deers. These are sort of the, some, some kinds of visual phenomena that I might be able to infer from visual data. Um, they're, they're basically, the list is actually is, is growing, and I just want to basically so show you examples of those. The other is basically size information. Um, so we did this paper at IIII. Hassan actually did that. The title of his paper was, uh, Do elef Are Elephants Bigger Than Butterflies or Not? Actually, we wrote a paper about this because we wanted to basically say that size information for object detection does matter, and how do we get this? I cannot ask people to start writing about this. But this is a sort of a visual phenomenon. I should be able to crawl it from pictures. If I ask, are, are, are butterflies bigger than elephants or not? Well, if you have a picture in which there is an elephant, there is a butterfly, and you have an estimate of depth, you should be able to say which one is bigger than which. The issue is that I cannot collect for all pairs of objects. I cannot, I cannot find enough number of images in which they, they co-occur. Watermelons and airplanes might not co-occur together enough times so that I can actually sort of do kind of inference. And our solution to that was, well, maybe I can actually might be able to find a path in the graph of co-occurrence of objects and sort of find a way to propagate information along. If I want to reason about the size difference between the butterfly and the elephant, I might not find enough pictures of them together, but I can find pictures of butterfly and people and people on the elephant. And I should be able to just propagate this information through people. And this is basically sort of what we did. And we figured a, an automatic way of sort of populating a big knowledge base about size comparisons of objects. Uh, the depth, you mean. So we have, there are single image depth estimators that we can use. So the beauty of these kind of knowledge extraction systems is that they, well, all they need is sort of high precision. I don't care about recall. So there are single image depth estimation approaches that give you very high accuracy at their high threshold, and I don't care about the rest because I can afford throwing many, many images away. So what we do is we do single image depth estimation. We get a relative depth. We do object detection. We adjust for depth difference, and then we do the comparison between the size differences. Questions? Okay. So these are examples of sort of knowledge extraction systems. Um, how much time do I have? So let's go to the last part, which is sort of how can I reason? And by there are different definitions of reasoning, and people actually have different meanings when they say reason. I'm intentionally being loose over here. I'm going to show you some samples of what reasoning mean visually. So my favorite is this one. So if I ask you what's going to happen next, 
you have a clear understanding of what's going to happen next. And if I force you, you can actually talk for minutes about this phenomenon. This is going to roll down. If I adjust it, if I, if I make this shorter, this is going to actually roll less. If I increase this, this is going to roll more. So basically, the space, uh, the, the amount that you understand from this single image is phenomenal. And it doesn't get any visually any simpler than this. It's just a triangle in a circle. And still, we know a lot about it. So basically, one form of reasoning that I would like to study is sort of reasoning based on very, very simple physics. And we did this project at CBPR, uh, Roosevelt did it, which is basically the idea is, can I, what I, what I, what I tend to call Newtonian image understanding, can I understand images in a Newtonian way? Can I understand that this, in fact, is a projectile? I would expect this to move like this. If, I, if, you, if you force me, I know that the force velocity is this way, the, the force vector is in this way, and the velocity vector is in this way. This is sort of, again, very, very simple Newtonian understanding of visual, visual, visual world. How do we do this? Well, what kind of movements can I study? So we, as usual, we, study, we start with the simplest possible scenarios. So we went to high school physics, and we figured that high schoolers can actually sort of reason about simple movements in a Newtonian way. We call them Newtonian scenarios. And these are standard things that we all study in high school, and we can write equations from, for, and all of those. A, a standard surface, swinging, projectile, pushing, dropping, push, uh, uh, pulling, uh, throwing, and all of those things. And sort of how, to, how can I dem demonstrate this visually? Well, one thing that we did is basically, we said, uh, the one thing that we can do is I can actually go to a game engine. These are the engines that gamers, game developers use to, to build games. These are sort of engines with, that are powered with Newtonian equations. In those engines, if I, if, I have a, if I have a volume over here, an object over here, if I drop it, it's going to drop. And if I have a standard surface, it's going to roll. And the way they work is basically just write down Newtonian equations. So that was actually great for us because this would, this would bridge the equations to visual world. Again, this visual world is very, very abstract, very simple, but at least show me a motion that resembles the equations that, uh, that corresponds to Newtonian scenarios. Then we went on, and for each of those, we collect enough data in terms of images and videos that corresponds to those kinds of motions. And now, if I want to make inference about what's going to happen to this ball in this image, what I need to do is first I need to figure out what kinds of Newton, what, which of the scenarios, which, which of the Newtonian scenarios does this image depict. And subtle image cues can actually help me with that. If I see a basketball hoop, that's probably people are aiming at that. If I see a person behind it, this is probably a source for a force. Now, of course, I don't want to start enumerating those or doing it in an explicit way. What I need, want to do is to sort of do it in an implicit way. So first, I need to figure out that, okay, this might be a projectile. But that's not enough for me because I need also to know, to know which state in this uh, video corresponds to this single image. So I need to know this is actually this specific instance or frame in this video that corresponds to this image. If I know how to do that, then the rest is easy. Because all I can do is I can actually go to this frame in the game engine, just borrow Newtonian equations, figure out the force direction, the velocity direction, and trajectory. And, trajectory. and then what I can do is just superimpose it over the image and say, this is my prediction of what's going to happen to the ball in this image. This is the direction of the force. This is the direction of the velocity. So the secret happens over here. How can I do this alignment? And the way that it turns out that actually it works is basically, again, surprisingly, with another form of ugly neural network, which basically sort of turn, tries to align these kind of different kinds of phenomena. A visual image, a, a natural image with a state in a game engine. For those of you who, those of you who care about this, basically, the, the complexity arises when, we when, the, when we're going to search for a latent variable over here, and that's basically what state does this belong to. And it turns out that actually there is a way to learn this without a, the direct supervision. And at the end of the day, we have a way of aligning an image with a state in the game engine. And the rest is actually straightforward. So here are some examples. We ask the system, what's going to happen to this object? 
And the predictions are, this is what I, what's going to happen to this picture. What's happening? Oh, there you go. So this is basically the actual prediction system. This is what's going to happen to this image. What's going to happen to this ball? This is what's going to happen to this ball. This is what's going to happen to this car. This is what's going to happen to this car. Uh, what's going to happen to, uh, to this boy? Well, we'll think this is what's going to happen to the boy. And what's going to happen to this? Uh, and of course, the answer is correct. I've tried it. So it's going to fall. Obviously, it fails to recognize the ramp as a slanted surface, and it thinks that actually the the guy is sort of hanging from a wall. And of course, if you're hanging from a wall that way, you're going to drop. So, but this is sort of, again, one step forward towards understanding the outcome of actions. You can now start reasoning about uh, forces and velocities and vectors. So search for a Newtonian image understanding, and you can actually download the code or the data. Again, XXX is not the right address, but just Google it and you'll find it. But again, this is still a big gap between this and the crow thing, because the crow could act in the real world. And I want to sort of, all of the stuff that we do in, in, in computer vision, or most, almost all of it, is sort of passive image understanding. Here is an image, make a prediction of a label of some sort. But the crow's word is actually interactive, interactive. The crow can push things, can poke things, and sort of these systems are not, does not allow me to do that. So how can I make things uh, sort of interactive? And we did two things in that regard. So one project that Roosevelt did was sort of he built a system that allowed him to sort of apply forces to specific objects in a single image and makes predictions. So we wrote this paper for ECCV this year. The title of the paper was very informative. We call it What Happens If. And the story is actually what happens if I apply a specific force to a specific object in a single image, can I make a prediction about what's going to happen to it? And it turns out to some extent, yes, you can actually make predictions that say this is going to actually follow this path. How do I make the system intractable? What we did, interactive, what we did was sort of, we went to one of the famous data sets in Vision Sun RGD, RGBD data set. We reconstruct that data set in a game engine. Again, and once I'm in a game engine, it's a sort of a Newtonian world, I can actually start applying forces to different entities in this world and see the outcome. That means that I can actually start sort of generating lots and lots of training data for myself by just poking things around. What do I want to learn? I want to learn that if I push this thing from this direction, it's going to probably move that way. If I push something against the wall, it's not going to move. And if I throw this at this thing, it's going to bounce back. So very basically, very, very basic things about movements of the objects, we actually start learning from this data. Of course, this is a very, very crude 3D understanding of the world. I'm going to show examples of actually how can we refine it. But let me start with that. Again, for those of you who care about how to do this, again, it's an alignment story. Where we, what we want to do is we're going to actually sort of have an embedding of the image and have an RNN. Uh, recurrent neural networks that sort of predicts a sequence of actions one after the other. And we do this jointly together. That means that for each single image, we know the right answer. We learn models to sort of follow the same, uh, same pipeline. Let me show you some of the results and show you where it fails. Um, so sort of in this image, we're asking the system, what's going to happen if I push this thing this way? And the result is basically in the crude space or in the image space would be that. What's going to happen if I push this sofa that way? Obviously, it's going to move that way. So you need to understand free space, objects, obstacles, forces to be able to predict, do predictions like that. You can learn about bounces. And of course, this is, again, a successful result and also a failure because no table would bounce off a sofa. But again, in this system, it would, it would learn that with enough force, you might be able to learn that things would bounce off of each other. Um, for the sake of time, let me just skip through some failures. Um, just go through some failures. So these are examples of failures. Oh, this is my. So when, so in this case, we asked what's going to happen if I push the stove this way, and it doesn't recognize the cabinet as sort of an entity that occupies a volume and predicts that it will go through the cabinet. 
or what's going to happen to this table. It, it fails to recognize that there is actually free space over here, and it says nothing's going to happen because the sofa is going to block it. Uh, here it, 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 it's failing to recognize the wall and so on. So this is sort of was one step toward sort of understanding the, 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 the consequences of actions in a physical way. And I'm going to basically show two other examples of those. How much time do I have? Okay, that's good. So let me just go through this quickly. So one of the things that we want to do is understand the outcome of actions in, in another way. So physical way was one way. The other was sort of, sort of in an appearance way. If I sh play this video on pause and ask you what's going to happen next, you have a clear understanding of what's going to happen next. How do you know this? Because you've seen examples of these. You also have an understanding of the word, this thing cannot stay in the middle of the air, so it's going to drop. What is over here? Unless this guy is actually losing his mind, there's going to be a pool over here. And so I think that I know a lot about this without ever seeing a pool, and I want to sort of build this kind of system that does this. But that requires me to sort of rethink about action representations. Typically, when people present act, represent actions, they represent it in a, in a sort of appearance way. How does it look like? How does a penalty kick look like in a, in a, in a real football? So, and then the way that we think about it is that basically to us, a, a penalty kick is something that transformed the state of the words from the state it was before the PK to the state after the PK. Again, old school AI precondition effect definition, now in images. So basically what I want to do is I want to sort of model actions as explicit transformations from before to the after. And that requires basically us a little bit of the rethinking about pipelines of, of action recognition. Uh, this is what Chao Lang did with Abin of, uh, and I. And the idea is basically is I can encode the appearance of the state of the world before and the state of the world after, and I consider actions as literally as transformations. What I'm learning here is all of these embeddings, these embeddings, and actual transformations over here. Now that I can do this, I can actually start thinking about, now, now I can actually start making predictions about what's going to happen next. If I show the system this video and say, okay, what's going to happen after this? Well, going back to this module, I can forward this and get this vector. Then I can do is I can actually go to YouTube generate these vectors for all the videos in YouTube, or lots of videos in YouTube, find which one maximizes the similarity, and show you that video. And that's basically what I'm going to do. I'm going to basically pause over here, query for the videos and, and the large data sets of videos, and basically this is the system finds. This is what I think would happen after that. So I need to, I, I wanted to double check if, if this is sort of I'm being biased with contextual cues and many other things. So what we did is also we removed this class of actions from the pool data set and repeat the same experiment. And the system sort of find sort of dropping to the, to the like kind of examples. And this is another way of sort of thinking about what's going to happen next after the action. You can pause and ask what's going to happen next. And the system thinks this is what's going to happen next. And if I remove that, it will find different kinds of jumps. Um, just to double check again, one more thing. I can actually show the system some weird activities that it, we, it hasn't seen examples of this before. And I can sort of forward this video into, into, into my network, get my embedding, and ask, find me the nearest neighbors to this embedding in your data. And if I do basically that, uh, in our system, we don't have any babies pushing carts. But we can find basically the essence. I can encode the essence of the action. Somebody is going to push in something. And if I do a standard appearance-based systems, what's going to happen is that you will basically latch onto baby because that's sort of visually a dominant part of this, this video. So last part I want to talk about is sort of now that I understand that I can actually sort of predict the outcome of the action, and I know that the crow thing, one of the key elements to the crow thing is sort of being able to interact with the environment. So I wanted to actually sort of build this interactive environment that allow me to sort of move things around. So uh, there are old school studies actually that shows very strongly the benefits of interaction in perception. So the most famous one is basically the kitten carousel example. There were two kittens. The minute they're born, 
they sort of kept them in a very, very dark room so that their eyes did not develop outside in a, in a real world for, for a few weeks. And they sort of get them out of the room for a few hours per day. One of them, and they basically they attach them to a carousel. One of them could, again, bo both of them are sort of blindfolded, so you cannot see. One of them was free to do things, and the other was sort of confined in a box, so that it cannot perform any tasks. They wanted to test the importance of interaction in perception. After a few weeks, they got, they got, they got them out of the room, the dark room. They, they, they removed the blindfold, and it turned out that the kitten who could act was very comfortable adjusting to perception tasks, and very quickly it learns the perception. Whereas the other kitten that couldn't act in the ward was actually was just, was, was was sort of struggling in dealing with perception tasks, perceptual tasks. And this sort of the core essence that sort of convinced us that we need to actually think about interaction in a serious way. The issue is that well, it doesn't scale. How many robots can I buy, and how many rooms can I afford going into, and how many things can I afford breaking to be able to learn interacting with the environment? And the scalability was basically the biggest concern for us, and the solution that we ended up adopting was sort of going to these photorealistic synthetic environments. So we ended up sort of hiring artists that can design these photorealistic environments for us. These are basically sort of uh, very realistic, so you can actually I, I show you examples of those. The beauty of this environment is that they are interactive environments. You can push things in this environment. You can open a fridge. You can open a tap. And you're going to see the changes in pixels as a consequence of your actions. And that's sort of the core, the, 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 the core insight for me, because I wanted to see the, the effect of my action in pixel space. And I wanted to sort of learn what's going to happen in pixels if I do a specific action. And this environment would allow me to do that. And this way, so I can actually start thinking about sort of visual reinforcement learning tasks in a photorealistic environment. So I have my, my, my choice of reinforcement learning algorithm. These days, my deep reinforcement learning algorithm. It issues me a, a command that I think you need to do this specific action. I'll do the action over here. I render it in that scene. And I see the result of my action in pixels. And that would let me sort of start learning about, about the, the visual world by just, uh, by just playing uh, with, with the world. Let me just show you this environment. So this is basically the sort of area to Thor framework. We call it Thor, the house of interaction. And in this environment, you can obviously navigate through the environment, but you can actually start pushing things around. You can actually see what kind of forces would cause a chair to flip. And where should I touch to flip this chair? Where should I not touch to not to flip this chair? You can actually start sort of opening a fridge, sit inside the fridge. You can open a microwave, a cabinet door. You can actually learn that probably if you're looking for a glass, it's inside a cabinet. I can actually open the cabinet door to find that. You can open a tab and these kind of things. So the very first very, very simple task that we started exploring with this data is sort of navigation. I want my agent to visually learn to navigate through a space. What do I need to learn to navigate? Well, I cannot go through these things like that. If I want to navigate, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'm going to stop over here. I need to find free space. Some things I can actually push away in my way. Some things I cannot. And what we ended up doing is sort of exactly the same thing in this environment. We, we basically let our agent freely move around and do this, uh, this reinforcement learning algorithm, where you can actually basically just bump into so many things to develop a visual sense of what are the bumpable things. I cannot go through the wall. I can go through empty space. And if I want to go through there, this is the optimal path. Uh, at the beginning, it, it, it actually didn't work really well. Even with 10 million frames, it didn't work really well. We've been struggling to figure out what was the reason. And it turns out the reason was just data. These are actually hard, complex tasks. You're learning a navigation task through pixel changes. And after a while, we figured that if I provide only 100 million frames to this system, it can actually start learning to navigate. And these are examples of sort of the system navigating to different things. For example, in this case, going to books or going to, and then we go to many different things. We test the system on generalization 
across different scenes, across different tasks, across different, uh, uh, different objects. And so the results are in the paper. Actually, I encourage you to, to take a look at it. This is sort of the project that you can lose with it at AI2. We could do sort of continuous version of reinforcement learning or discrete version of this. These are basically sort of small details I'm going to skip over. Uh, we also showed that you can actually generalize to real scenes, meaning that I can actually get my laptop with a model on it, put it on a, on a, on a, on a robot in a real world, and see if it can generalize and navigate. And we did a very small scale experiment in this case. We let the, re let the robot roam around in the room to just get a sense of a room, and then a little bit of fine tuning in that room. You can actually start learning to go through the door. This is what the robot sees, and this is basically the robot itself. It can learn basically from here, go to, an, uh, to a microwave in an optimal way. And these are, these are basically the kinds of things that would sort of these kind of environments would allow you to do. Again, these are sort of scratches of the surface. We're really, really, really far away from what the, what the crow could do or any visual intelligent real agent in the real world could do. But these are sort of scratches of the surface on sort of coupling back the ideas from all AI, hardcore AI, to the visual domain, being able to sort of able to sort of do these kind of planning and reasoning tasks in a visual world. Uh, so I talked a little bit about how to parse the data in a more careful way, how to collect uh, hard kind of data, how to extract visual knowledge, and show a few examples of how to reason visually. And with that, I stop to just stay in time. Um, I can take questions at this point. So let me repeat the question. The question is that can we get rid of the failures of predictions of what's going to happen next in a game engine by just providing more and more data? Um, so there are two answers to that. The first one is that, well, we, again, it's, it, first, there are three answers. The first one is it's actually all, it's hard to answer that question because whatever amount of data I collect, you might ask, what if you double that and what's going to happen? So given the resources that we had, we sort of see this saturation around 50,000, 60,000 samples for those specific examples that you're referring to. Um, I don't think it's a data problem, and I do think it's an algorithm problem, meaning that the algorithms that we're using, we're expecting too much from our deep structures. You need to basically be able to reason about geometry. You need to reason about semantics. You need to reason about space. And all of those things with just one black box deep learning algorithm is just expecting too much. So the, I think the next steps of these kind of algorithms would be, in my belief, would be sort of in, uh, injecting some sort of explicit intermediate representations in the middle of these deep learning pipelines so that we force the, the different parts of this pipeline to focus on different aspects of, visu of, of a visual scene and then merge them back together. Yeah. So there are four reasons we're not there yet. Data, algorithm, compute platforms, and lack of mathematical formulation. Some of the problems I don't even know how to formulate to begin with. Imagine I go to the reasoning problem, and I want to basically touch an agent, t teach an agent to reason about making a coffee. There are many different steps involved. And the space of possible actions just explode immediately. And I don't even have a good way of mathematically, a good mathematical way of formulating that space to begin with. And I think a lot of effort in the next few years would sort of spend on figuring out what would be the right way of thinking about these problems.
know, running into hard things. It seems like it's basically, perhaps, it, it takes a little bit more physics, modeling the physics, uh, because even if you run into something, if it's a soft thing, then uh, obviously you're gonna, uh, you're still gonna move through it in a, in a, to a certain extent. Or if it's maybe a small obstacle that you can jump over, then uh, so. Yep. So this part, like the, the, the environment, the four environment that I'm showing, it's actually a very, very simplified version of the word, especially in terms of the agent. And of course, I'm not a roboticist, so I'm not approaching this problem the, from the robotics perspective in a sense that I don't want to go to control. That's even harder. So we're basically intentionally stopping at this shallow semantic level where there are actions you perform and you see the outcome of the actions. And I'm going to assume that someone is going to actually take care of the rest. But you're absolutely right that even if I, in this environment, I'm going to say push. But pushing a chair would be very different from pushing a, a big table. And all of those things actually require more and more understanding of the environment. We're not even close to actually even start thinking about those. So that's why we're sort of trying to simplify the environment to the extent that it's become a little manageable for us. And after that, you can actually start thinking about those actual problems. All right. We've got a couple of questions. Let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.